Hello, everyone. My name is Angelica Zadak, and welcome to another episode of Talk About It Tuesday with This Is Improv, our cheesy interview series where we talk to incredible people about the arts, and this time specifically improv. We have a very special guest today, Anthony LeBlanc. Hi, Anthony. Hi. I wonder if I should have, like, kicking my video in and popped in or something like that. Like, like ah, <laughs> I mean, here I am. Yeah, yeah. so thanks, thanks for coming on. This is great. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Anthony was our, um, my sister and mine, improv teacher in Second City. Uh, we did improv intensive and Anthony is a incredible director. He's uh, directed some uh, of the shows that were done at the Second City. So Anthony, what what are you what are you doing? Like, what are you doing now? Oh, uh, wow. Uh, so now I'm doing a couple of things. So I um, so I'm um, only now currently just in a uh, advisory position at, at Second City. I was actually running the company last year for a couple of months uh, until mm -hmm. we hired the new person, uh, John, who's awesome. And uh, so I kind of now been, you know, helping a little bit as far as like, you giving me advice of things or stuff like that. And then hopefully eventually, because um, I live between Chicago and LA, uh, mm -hmm. whenever we are able to physically start doing things uh, in LA, you know, hopefully I'll start hopefully being involved with that and helping out as much as I can. But my main job that I do is I work for Nickelodeon. Uh, so I'm an onset acting coach for Nickelodeon. So I work on shows where I help the kids and other actors um, do the rehearsal process as well as on filming and shooting days. Uh, I also work with um, Nickelodeon uh, casting department to help with um, different projects or talent development or working with different kids for you know different projects and things like that. So it's a really fun job. It's an awesome, awesome place to work. And it's it's really, it's a mixture of like fun, you know, cause you're like, as a kid, you're like, ah, oh, Nickelodeon. And yeah. it, it is just as fun when you're doing it, but also it's awesome. I love, I'm, you know, I love teaching. And so it's this really cool thing to get to work with these amazing young actors who, you know, or it's just always a surprises you how much like someone's like you're 10 or 12 and you're doing way more in your life than I ever thought about doing and it's really awesome and they're it's really fun it's awesome and everyone really cares about the kids which is awesome too a great place to work at because of that too and it's incredible that you're hopping back and forth and you're doing so much and uh, all these big things and, yeah. and it's the last year is it, it's been interesting just because like normally i'd be going back and forth physically uh -huh. but you know it's also it's a little faster because i'd be doing it digitally like i'd be like oh, i'm cool. in a meeting here but then i'm coaching a session here you know like all that stuff can happen on a, a zoom uh without you know spending a you know a couple hundred dollars to go from place to place yeah so. it's very cost effective <laughs> Yes, it is. Cool. What I really love about you as a teacher, because you're an incredible teacher. So Thank I can you. imagine I do things. You, you do all the cool things. It's really cool things you do. And uh, just imagining the kids having you there to help mentor them um, is a cool concept because one of the cool things about you is you're a nerd, you're a geek. You mm -hmm. yeah. like all these fun things that you know, uh, at least growing up uh, in theater for me, I didn't get to experience. We didn't really experience this culture, uh, like the nerd culture while we were performing. We went mm -hmm. back to the classics. We went back to whatever it was that was general knowledge. But mm -hmm. you really pushed and you really uh, allowed us to play with the, with the nerdism, with our interests and mm -hmm. let our personalities come out in that way. And, uh, and and it has a lot to do with your background. So, how did you get started with improv? What what, what was your oh. beginnings? Wow, what a <laughs> this is funny. This is a boring story, but it's okay. I'll tell it to you. Yeah, so I did not do theater as a kid. It was not my thing. Um, you know, as a fourth grade, you get forced to be in a play. Uh, and, and during the play, I was like Zeus and this like weird play about Newt Rockney, um, which I remember at some point asking, so, like someone else actually had seen this, like and heard, knew about this play too, which is pretty funny. Um, but it's like a weird play about Newt Rockney and how he, you know, came to, to you know, change Notre Dame football. Um, wow. But it's it's weird. Um, so uh, so yeah. So that was like, the only play I ever did, and uh, I, I played. I did music a lot, and that was thing I really liked. But I was more of a science person. Um, you know, I loved computers. I loved science. I wrote my first program when I was seven years old. That was like the thing I really cared about a lot. I wanted to work for NASA. 
uh, it was one of my dreams. Um, and uh, I went to um, school for computer science and physics. That's what I majored in. So my goal in life was to always be in sciences. Um, and uh, for me, one of the kind of big things or, or kind of changes or things that you know made a difference is uh, I had a I had an older brother um, who was nine years older than me. And when I was in high school, I, between my junior and senior year, he passed away. And he was always the outgoing person who like always like, he like did lots of the local community center stuff doing, you know, lots of volunteering. He worked at the CP rehab center where he was a clown. And then eventually started like working there uh, in his uh, downtime. Um, he worked with Boy Scouts, a lot of stuff like that. And so where I was the, like, everything's an experiment and uh, people are, don't mean anything and like why talk to humans you know it's it's weird because people i did do things that were kind of like church stuff and school stuff and i ran track and things like that and i wasn't like you know hanging out you know and never talking to people but Mm -hmm. i wasn't a person that really was as outgoing other than like um being interested in, in interests but i was never like the flashy kid who's like look at me i'm a than theater. So, but I was friends with those folks, uh, which is kind of funny. Um, but whenever he died and I, you know, went to college, one of the things I kind of took on um, was kind of this world of like trying to do things that he would do. His name's David. So it was always like doing things that David would do. And so I, a lot of it was like saying yes to things. Uh, and it's before I learned yes and world. It was just me just choosing to like, okay, if someone offers this thing and it seems like it might be somewhat interesting or something he would do, then I'll try it. Cause it was a mixture of me trying to like get close to him and, and kind of understand him, but also um, in a way trying to do something different in my life. Um, you know, cause he, he was 27 when he died uh, and kind of like the thing of like trying to make some different choices in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was a resident assistant at Loyola in New Orleans where I had a bunch of folks on my floor that were like wanting to put together this w- improv show. It these, these guys were like, yeah, they watch Hughes line. They want to put something together. I was like, okay, I'll help you do this. And so we put it up and uh, it was good. It, people laughed. Um, that's good. The, that's, that's a but, good sign. <laughs> but the, and I enjoyed it. But the funny part of it is that, that pe- the, ones, the, the people who were watching it was a bunch of theater folks who were actually were trying to put together a sketch group. Oh, and cool. they were like, they came to me and said, hey, you're really funny. Have you ever thought about doing this? Because mm-hmm. that other thing was like a one-time thing. We kind of just did it as like a fun floor thing. It was like, you know, residents on the floor, I did an improv show. And so I was like, okay. And so then I tried out for their sketch show and then they added me to the groups. So it was me and a bunch of theater and communication folks. And we started doing sketch in New Orleans. And at the time, uh, we were the only sketch group there. This was like, you know, 1999 um, the, was when this happened, uh, 2000. And so for the uh, last two years of school, um, I was in a sketch group. Uh, we started off as Plan B and then became Boxaganga uh, is the name of it. Um, and we did shows in the French Quarter. We did shows on campus. Um, you know, every, the, the summers in between, we put up a show every week for the span of the summer, which is really cool at this, um, coffee shop slash theater space that was in New Orleans. It was really awesome because we wrote a new show every week. Uh, we had special guests that came on, stand-ups would come and do stuff with us. We'd, you know, invite folks to come. We went to go, we go to open mics a lot and do some of our sketch to kind of meet the other stand-ups and folks to kind of get to that community. And at the time, the only other kind of comedy things that were happening, there was two other, there was two other improv groups. Uh, one uh, was called This Is Brown, and the other one was called Without a Net, and it was a net name spelling. Um, okay. And so, and so, so we also made friends with those folks too. And like, so we would do stuff where we like they did improv, we do sketch, we sometimes get together. But it was a really fun time, and it was a cool experience, and I loved it. It was super fun. Moved to Chicago after that, um, and the reason I moved there has been between junior and um, seen, um, um, uh, going to college, I went to do this cool program in DC where it was like 20 Jewish kids, 20 Catholic kids, 20 Protestant kids living together um, in an American university, learn about social justice and faith play together. Um, that was one of the cat. I was one of the Catholic kids. Um, uh-huh. and it was an amazing experience. It was a really cool summer and learned a lot. It was, it was amazing. Um, so we 
it went on for a couple of years and then funding wise it ended the grant they got for it ended and they wanted to use um, some money from the Ford Foundation they had gotten to research it the last year to do something with the you know what how could we do more things with this so a bunch of people came to dc thought leaders uh, religious leaders um, um uh, legislators uh to do a several day kind of like thing to come up with what are things we could do around social justice and faith and um uh, one of the things that are created uh, was the idea of a service house uh, called the interfaith service house and it was seven people living together in chicago originally it was going to be dc then new york then chicago uh-huh. um there's new york actually for a long time which uh is interesting for a reason i'll get to in a second um we it was this awesome awesome experience um i was the catholic kid in the house i uh, went international folks in it and it happened to be where we moved in a week before september 11 and that was kind of a, a and so one of the residents in our, our house that was international is a Sufi Muslim from Turkey. And, you know, one of the things that instantly started to happen after that is in Chicago specifically, there are a lot of things for, for sure that happened that were like, attacks are happening, mosques being messed with. So we were kind of very active in participating and um, helping with those kinds of things of like cleaning up and, and sitting and watching places at night and things like that, as well as um, our, our house kind of becoming a weird thing of these people living together kind of world so mm-hmm. it, it was so it was it was a great experience but it was a thing that i originally intended to only move to chicago for a year uh-huh. to do this house and then leave and go back to grad school and be like okay cool this is fun uh but the thing that was interesting is one of our um advisors one of the people that were on the board of advising for this project uh was this guy mcantigua um who worked for city year who happened to also be on a team at io and he was like talking to me and he's like hey like so you you know you do this um you do stuff at your school right and this is when we were kind of originally before i moved he's like you should when you come and you finally move in the house come to this place it's, at the time it's improv olympic come to improv oh. olympic come see my team show it'll be real fun you see what long form's about and i'm mm-hmm. like okay yeah. whatever yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so and so then I remember. So the first Second City show I saw in person was that same visit where I came to like do the kind of like, we're gonna move in the house in a couple of months. But we, uh, I went to I went got off the plane went to see a Second City show. It was really awesome. It was fun. Talked to Mac, and then I came back in September, and I remember like maybe it was like it took me a little bit because you know the world was kind of crazy but i want to say maybe sometime like later in september i then went to see a show and his show was at you know the 10 ish 10 10 30 slot and um it was really funny so space mountain was the name of his team super cool there's a lot of people on that team that i still no um and it's it was like so fun and then the thing afterwards was like back in the day they used to have a jam every uh night on saturday every saturday is on midnight it was free and so i stuck around to be at the to be in the jam and then i wound up going back to the jam every week for like many years at that point I and mean, even up running at some point but it was it kind of got me into that and there was a guy there uh, Craig Euler, um, who was like, hey, like, you, you should take classes. And I was like, well, I'm living in a service house and I'm not really making a lot of money. That's the whole point. And it's very crazy. And so, um, uh, what I, so that was the thing that I was like, okay, well, let me do this. And this is my one outlet that I did as far as like, mm-hmm. you know, the house is very cool and awesome and intense, but like that was my doing classes and going to the jam was my kind of break. And so I had classes on Saturdays in the afternoon and then I would hang out with some people after, and then I'd stick around, watch shows and then go to the jam on Saturday nights. And that was kind of my routine it was like Saturday nights. If we weren't doing house stuff, I would go and go to IA. And so, yeah, so that's, so that's what got me into there. And I took, cl- I took classes, I finished, I got on a team. And at the point where I got on it, I stuck around for an extra year to finish classes. And my job assignment I had had another opening that I could stay at. And mm-hmm. then after that, in the middle of second year being in Chicago, I was like, okay, it's time to get together. I finished this thing, let's kind of go to grad school, all right. And so I was starting to apply to grad schools. And I was like, like you know, this is two years in. I was like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to audition for Second City and see what happens. And mm-hmm. if I get called back, then maybe that means I should, you know, stick around in this area. But uh-huh. if I don't, then I'm going to go anywhere. Because one of the things is this true. If you're in hard sciences, if you're willing to, you should be able to go anywhere 
and and go for free or very little because like somewhere will give you things of like hey come to Des Moines and do this research right. you know it's 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 it, well, it's a weird thing about scientists because huh. as long as you can have the, the grades and those kinds of things like you're gonna work in a lab or you're gonna you know you're gonna do research so it's like it's labor it's free labor so there's a certain amount of that but you just might wind up in a place where you're like well, I guess I'm going to Montana to do like readings of this seismograph for the next year wow. you know what i mean you know what i mean like but there's stuff like you know, hopefully i didn't know the rock star lifestyle of scientists well, i don't know if it's rock star but it but it is it is one of those things that's just like it's just one of those things that because there's research to be had uh -huh. there's a lot of, now you have to still have good grades you have to interview you might have a lot, there's a lot of things to go around but if you keep trying and you're good now if you're not you know, if you're a person that has terrible work and stuff like that, then yeah, you're not going to get a job. But it's, it's, but it's basically like you're getting a job that also comes with school, you know, and that's what you're kind of doing, which is a little different than some other types of things, like a business, an an MBA or something like that. Hopefully your work should pay for it, you know, <laughs> you make them give you uh, that continuing education yeah. money. So that was kind of my thing. Because there were a lot of great schools that I thought would have been really cool in Chicago. And then I just went like, well, then I have to, you know, figure it out and take loans to go to the school that if I get in that, you know, I, that, I, that's here. And so, yeah, so then I auditioned for Second City. Uh, at that time, the only auditions for the general auditions that led to being an associate for the training company. Uh, and so I auditioned and then I got called back. And I got hired, and that was that. I had never left Chicago and started working for Second City, um, and that was then my life for the next seventeen years. Um, so yeah, so yeah, started. Two, I got hired in two thousand three, and you know, toured, so main stage, and directing, and then just director, and then interim EP. Wow, it's a match made in heaven. It was meant to be. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I, that's fine. I, I didn't know all of I didn't know half of what led, especially during the time, because that is that's a scary time uh, by September 11th and having everyone come to the because that's such a great program to have all of these different uh, backgrounds mm -hmm. come together and work together. And I feel like that's such an improv philosophy type of thing too. Mm -hmm. It's so many yeah. things social justice that's great well. yeah that, it was just sad that it didn't continue on like it, it was only for three more two more years after us but it just got too hard to get people in the country and the the, the group that was doing it didn't want to have the house with just all americans which i agree with and it was but it just it became so prohibitive because of um how um it what it took to get papers to come for specifically certain uh countries and certain types of projects so you got into Second City, you mm -hmm. and you know you're still there. Uh, what are what are some of your favorite memories? Was there anything that really sticks out to you as maybe an altering moment in your life? It changed the way you look at uh, Second City. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I can give you I can give you three things. Uh, Ooh, two, 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 two. Yeah, two things that'll be yeah rule of threes. Two things that'll be kind of like okay, and then one that might be if anybody watches this that knows me might be news. Some people know, but not some people don't. Um, um, so uh, the first one uh, is that um, t touring was uh, amazing. It was great, um, yeah. but touring also taught me a lot about America and why entertainment is the way it is. You know, there was a lot of these things where you go to so many different places mm -hmm. and you see different material play so many different ways mm -hmm. based on the, the city, the crowd, is it a college, is it a performing arts center, is it a benefit, right? Mm -hmm. It's all makes sense when you think about it in your head, right? But a big thing is like, once you see it play out, if you do something, we have the we have the kind of gift of getting to tour. I went to almost every state in the country and then some international places, and um, it, it really helped me to understand why things are funny to different people. And it very much applies to some of the stuff that I teach or things that I've worked with. And you know, and, and greater smarter people have put together things about the of comedy. Um, but this is one of the things you start to experience that idea of like. Um, I, I try to park that to the kids that I work with of like, mm -hmm. there's, there's gonna be a lot of things that you do that you don't find funny, but you have to understand why it's funny to someone else because of the type of joke you're doing or, or what you're delivering. It might not be your brand, but part of being a performer is that you take on other brands of comedy to suit whatever the material is and the best vehicle for that thing. Is there um, an example of that? 
like um, can do example. Oh well, yeah, yeah. Like, like you know, like first, you know, some, for example, there. This is probably extreme, but there are places where, like, we were touring, um, you know, during the Bush years, and we had a, you know, a scene. Uh, we as an archive scene called Lingo that was written by uh, two uh, really amazing folks uh, on main stage, Claudia Wallace and Antoine McKay, and Brian um, Calvin was in that as well, Jean Belafique. One of the things that's really cool about that is like one place you go, and it's, it deals with like two couples, like one's conservative, one's liberal, and they're kind of like going back and forth. And they haven't seen each other since college, and part of the thing is how different they are now than when they were in college. And there are certain places where like people are like, yeah, it's great, yeah, you know. Sorry, wrong name. Lingo is the, Lingo is the one where it's like the office. That's the office. Okay, okay, that's okay, okay. The office. So I'm confusing that with visit, but uh -huh. Lingo is the one where it's like it's it's two black people in the office, and they have uh -huh. to change how they speak in oh. order to and then the white folks are all speaking in rap terms to them and then they at the end they kind of call out the fact of like what are you doing like you know you know and it's like it's this perception of what you have of us and it's mm -hmm. it was cool because also you know uh, claudia who wrote it you know she wrote it from experiences she had even like uh, you know in across the street at the bar we usually hung out with with servers being that way and then coming back and bringing that back to a stage which mm -hmm. also always blew my mind of like getting to talk to a lot of the other black performers and like finding out why did you do this and what's, and everyone's awesome. Uh, Claudia's awesome. Um, but um, that scene, we would take some places and then be like, oh yeah, you did that for us, right? Because this is like, you know, it's like, well, that's a little weird because you're slightly racist um, <laughs> audience member. Um, but then hopefully, hopefully you learn something about yourself and question yourself. But then other people, it's like, you know, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe you, you came here and said this. And like, this is blowing my mind and I want to do this, you know, or I'm so happy you came here. And so there's a lot of that things of how, and in other places, you know, you go and do certain scenes and they're like, like the other scene visit that has the couple that Cla Claudia is also in. There are people who get upset about that scene uh, of like the things we said about Bush or things in that, or in other places they loved it. Right. And so mm -hmm. you start to see how things play around the country and sometimes in the same tour where you'd be like, you're in this part of Kansas, you go to this part of Kansas and this part of Kansas and have three totally different experiences wow. based off of who the audience is, what they're into. And then, you know, you then come back to see like why certain shows are so popular or why certain things at a certain time do very well and some don't like you see how big the country is and how different we are like it's it's a giant country full of a lot of very different people yeah. and we sometimes forget that like there's there's some things that are american but very little like you know there is a, such a vast country so that's one two i'm trying i'm trying to pick up sorry i'm really um the second no, one is it was, um, you know, I got to be, I was lucky to be on stage during the 50th anniversary. Um, and it was pretty amazing. A lot of people came back. It was this awesome thing where a lot of alumni were there and things like that. And I remember in all the things that were happening, and I, I do say this a lot to um, uh, folks that are at Second City or, or, or people who, like you, who are um, running your own place. Um, you know, one of the cool things is like we're sitting backstage and all these alum are hanging out and we're kind of the hosts running this giant show. And I remember, it, you know, this kind of moment where like Stephen Colbert is like, hey, like, thank you for letting us be here. And I was like, we're all like, what are you talking about? Like, that? he's like, no, you don't get it. It's like, this is going to be probably one of the best times of your creative life because you're right now at a place where what Second City is, is the people who are right now on stage. Like you get to say and do and speak about what's happening. And that's what keeps this place what it is. And, you know, eventually you're going to go off to a place where like other people have a say in what you're doing. And, and it, it's more of that thing of like, you can't do and uh, But this year, like it has to be about this. And it's always going to be different because different people are going to come behind you to then become the next cast. It's whatever that cast is. And I was like, that's pretty amazing. Like sometimes we forget sometimes, especially at theaters is that the theater has to evolve because the people who are the theater evolve, right? If yeah. it, you know, it, it, like 10 years ago, whatever theater is gonna look very different of like who, what, what's funny, what's the thing. And so that I think is kind of the a thing that stuck with me. And I kind of also took with me when I'm, you know, I was, you know, internally running the company of like being okay with making or offering big changes or, or trying to set up places where big change could happen. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that like part of my job was to help push things hard, but mm -hmm. also knowing that whoever came after me, cause I 
by design, when I took the job, I did not want to have the job full time mm -hmm. uh, as, as the permanent person because I thought like, I, I didn't think it would, it should have been me. I, you know, I, I had been there for so long and I wanted some, I thought it was better to have someone to come in who was fresh and had new ideas, and, but also had experience in those kinds of things. And mm -hmm. then also I had made a choice before the, the pandemic had happened uh, of like, I'm going to start to sort of fade away a little bit from Second City and just do some mm -hmm. project and things, but really dive into LA and, and Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. um, um, so that was a the thing there. And then the third thing, which is might be news to some people, if they watch this, you may or may not know about me, uh, I am on the spectrum. Um, um, and um, improv is a thing that 100% uh, unknowingly, I didn't get diagnosed until five years ago, but I had already, because of that choice very much so of living uh, as my brother would, kind of pushed me into a place of learning how to deal with difference and change and things like that in a way that improv we uh, at second city we have an entire program that's improv for autism mm -hmm. where it's amazing the work that happens there and the two teachers that do it in, in chicago are fantastic uh nick and molly and it's so cool like seeing how improv in that space allows for folks at different levels and, 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 and on that spectrum to be able to play and do things and deal with the idea of how things might be changed and different, but they have the, the ability to do it without the, the kind of um, uh, stress of the failure that comes with real life. And so mm -hmm. the ability to apply that and that, you know, and very much so like going through my life and kind of category, uh, category, uh, cataloging, how, why did this work out for me and how these, I would, I, you know, probably most people can't tell, or, or that's not thing it presents as, as strongly, especially in work situations. Um, but a lot of it's because of improv. Like improv taught me how to, I got to go on stage for many years of my life and like be in an office and we're like, do this thing. And so I did it hundreds of times where I got to do all these things. And it was very funny. I think I go back to like even early improv world of like where people are like, oh, that's such a crazy idea. Ha <laughs> ha. And I'm like, I was just doing what I thought because I don't know, you know, uh, just because of like, for me, it was just me playing through like, this is a logical choice. Uh, I don't have all those social cues. And so over time, though, it, it, it helped me so much. So like, improv for me is definitely a thing that, you know, allows me to function to a point where like, I look back at like, and that's why I kind of mentioned, like, I look back to me as a child. And I definitely had, I had a lot of those things of like, things changing bothered me a lot and would cause disruptions. I was definitely very much rule oriented person. I was a very literal person. Um, there's a lot of things around that. Um, a lot of sensitivity to things. If like you move something in a place, it would freak me out as a kid. And uh, you know, the idea of going through improv and then touring and all those kind of things created a way that I learned how to have my own coping skills through that. I'm not saying that don't, if you're, you know, please go get professional help. All those things are great. Um, but improv is a great thing that I think, uh, you know, we've definitely very much want to do more of that second city of uh, being able to kind of help in that way of how much improv can help with so many different things uh, in that wellness world. That's so incredible. Oh, thank you for the three things because yeah. all all three things first blew my mind, uh, inspired me, uh, taught me, and I, I had no idea that you were on the spectrum. And so many of the choices that you've made uh, based off just conversations and knowing you as, as a teacher, it was like, wow, the bravery of being out there and just being so full of yourself. And that's something cool that improv does for you too, because you have to be in the moment, but mm -hmm. also because of the social cues and everything like that. And I I do love how improv is kind of like, uh, Viola Spolin would say she diagnosed people, right? With, mm -hmm. uh, with improv techniques and just knowing that you get at Second City, you're, you're pushing that to another level and uh, how much it helped you personally with making those choices and helping you like enhance the ability to, you know, go in diff different directions, uh, but not knowing, not knowing that what that was doing for you. And it just mm -hmm. naturally helped you improve in that way. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And thanks also for the inspiration and uh, the Colbert story and inspired and so needed and going to the different, um, the different countries. It's like different countries, the different states and cities. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that that's pretty cool. Thanks. We are like a bunch of different countries. And I mean, that's where the United States, right? Like yeah. it is, that's, it is crazy. Texas is so different from Illinois. It's just so different from Florida. Yeah. It's like, I like to think about ancient Greece, like the Spartans yeah. in the Athens, it, it was Greece, but mm -hmm. you know, the st city states were not in agreement yeah. that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of how we live. We're a democratic republic, right? We're the mixture of Greece and Rome. And <laughs> let's see if it works, you know. What is one improv tip? Like, what's one thing that you would say is, like, an improv philosophy that you live by? Gotcha. Um, so I would, I'm going to give you two. One is going to be for – is is I'm kind of feeling some feels right now because I just got through watching uh, – finishing uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier last night. Uh, or, uh, it, and it's it's uh, it's so great. It's awesome. Uh, but it has a lot to – it's blowing my mind a lot because it has a lot to do with, like, race in the moment and stuff like that. Uh -huh. So I'll give two things. One's going to be kind of general, and one will be more – BIPOC driven. Um, the first one, um, which is kind of the general one, that's a philosophy that I think is good to have is, for me, it's kind of came from my science background. You know, we always, you know, there's this moment in my schooling at Loyola where, and I think I mentioned this in class before, that idea of like, you know, and, and when you get thermodynamics, you talk about probability, which leads you to that world of quantum theory and things like that is your next class. And, you know, it, the, our teacher sat and was like, this is the way you learn to be a physicist assistant that's someone who's learns physics right he's really cool dr uh, carl brands he's really awesome um but he would he drew a box on the board put a dot in the box and he says you know what's the probability you know uh, that that dot is in that box you know it was like 100 percent um and it's like there's no 100 percent in the universe and it's like if you think about it and if you say that dot is on mars there has to be a 0, 0.00 but if you keep going eventually there's going to be some number that's there that is that place where it is at some point to be a dot is on mars and there's only separated by time space and conditions that makes that true and that idea of like being able to like live inside of the things that are highly improbable but mm -hmm. nothing is impossible like the idea that if you can believe it imagine it uh, conceptualize it and then find the math to make it work then it's something that has to then be possible that's how the improbable, you have to find a version of the space around this like, you know, planet that's circling this certain thing that makes those conditions for X. But if you can do the math and it works out, it can. So for me, when it comes to improv, is that thing I started talking about with Fermi Estimation, things like that, like these things of where you and improv, if you can imagine those things, you can make good approximations at them and you can then still be in them. You can believe them. So like talking animals, if you, commit to it and believe it, it can happen, right? Mm -hmm. It's not our world, but if you can imagine it, it has to exist somewhere. You just have to believe it and make the time space conditions for that to exist. So that's a really, you know, weird rudimentary way of slaving those two things together, but that's the thing I always kind of live by. That's awesome. um, the other one, which is more for uh, the BIPOC folks who might be watching, watching but also for uh, anyone in, that, in a marginalized group, whether it be uh, women or anything of that nature, where, you're othered or you're the minority in that situation. In an improv and comedy, it's, you know, for a straight white man. That's pretty much what that is. Um, but there's a there's a, a, a piece of advice that um, this really awesome uh, teacher, director, and person that, that was in on that one first show that I saw at Second City. Uh, his name's David Pompey. Um, he, you know, there's a point in my career where I was very much like, why am I here? I was supposed to be doing this stuff. I wanted to be at and work in, I'm, I'm so far behind, I'm going to get my, my master's. What is going on? I don't know why I'm at Second City. This is crazy. Um, and I was, you know, it's kind of like feeling like I was failing at life by working there. Um, yeah. And a lot of it because it happened very fast. Um, and, um, you know, there was a lot of things that would come up against where I knew people had been saying things um, not to me, but I knew they haven't said about me of like, oh, the only reason you're there is because you're black. And that's the kind of thing. And so, you know, when I was kind of like, why do I, why am I dealing with this? Like, this isn't my life. And, you know, he took me out to lunch one day and, you know, he told me, he said, you know what, like you're where, right now you're where you're, you're you need to be. And he's like, people that want you to be here, you're, you're here because they want you to be here. And he said, and here's the thing you have to remember is that um, if you're, bad right or you're are you just okay if you happen to be a white dude you kind of fade into the mediocrity of all the other 
mediocre white dudes and then you can kind of coast by in that world it's like but if you stand out and you're the only type of person that's in that group they're going to remember you and if you're bad you're gonna be that bad black guy that was in that show if you're good you're gonna be that good black guys in the show if you're just in between you're gonna be that in between black guy in that show is going to fun thing of bad like you won't fade into the background of things that unforgettable so if you got to a certain level or so far it's because you stood out because if you didn't and you didn't have the ability, you still would have stood out as being that bad. And so that was the thing of like, so if you get anything, no matter why they gave it to you, you only got it because you deserve to get the job in the first place. Right. And so I think that's the thing for people to remember in that place of like, don't allow other people's reasons why you shouldn't have gotten the thing to take away from the fact that you got the thing, but do the best you can with that thing you got. Right? That's cool. Yeah, I, I feel like that's something so many people need to hear, uh, especially BIPOC, because there there is that um, that feeling of, you know, like th- the feeling of other and the feeling mm. of, uh, you know, and it, it's out there and to to go through or going into something that you love, that you're passionate about, that you want to do and always having that voice in the back of your head is so destructive. So Mm -hmm. it's so cool that you had, um, you had a teacher, you had someone to guide you (laughs) through feeling confident in what you were doing because you've done so many great things uh, for Second City, like directing the show. I think you, was it the first full black cast? Uh, in- um, so it wasn't full, but wait, so when I did it, like, so the first cast had three black folks in Chicago. So Detroit had had it happen before. Okay. Um, cause, cause the makeup of the, uh, of like the dynamics uh-huh. of the city and who they want in that show, but was the first resident cast where they had three black people in the same show. Um, and that was, uh, whenever yeah. discontent. And then the, and then the, um, soul brother that I directed yeah. was the first one that had two black women in the same show in Chicago. So that only happened and only it happened in Detroit as well. I was lucky enough to see some of the scenes while we were taking classes. We we went through the scenes and it was really cool. So both shows did, but I think I think timing wise, I'm thinking of when you came. I, it was Soul okay. Brother. I'm pretty sure. It okay. Was. Oh, you had rough scenes from. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that that's incredible. And thank you so much for telling me about all of these things, for teaching me, get, you're inspiring me, you're pumping me up. I'm totally pumped up. And uh, before we go, I have one last question for you. Mm-hmm. It might be the hardest question that you've had today. Uh, what is one thing about you that we couldn't be able to tell just by looking at you? So it can't be anything Star Wars related. Can't be. Okay. Um, that they can tell that we can tell or can't tell by looking at cannot, me. Cannot tell. Oh, um, uh, well, I mean, cause I'm also, I wear a lot of the things that I love. So you could always tell I'm nerdy by what I wear and what I do. You wouldn't know that, um, there are certain, th- certain music or musics, musics or things like that, that like, so as a person on spectrum, there's a lot of things that we'll, you use to like, cope or center you or those kinds of things like some people's touch or something. for me um i have a fascination with and i don't know where i got it uh other than like it's the group i latched on to when i was watching alternative nation when i was in junior high i don't know why it's this group uh but the sundays is a group that no matter what when i listen to the sundays it always calms me down and uh, it's like my it's like the thing of the music that i use to relax uh, and also if I need to fall asleep and I can't fall asleep because my brain's always kind of going, um, I will put on the Sundays and I can fall asleep. So I have this weird obsession with this band from England from the early nineties. Uh, the, the two things that you might most know them from, uh, is that if you like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Wild Ho- their cover of Wild Horses was used in one of the episodes when they're at the bronze. Okay. Um, and so that's a thing. Uh, and then um, Summertime, which is like one of their first, the first song off their third album um, was in like one of those weird late 90s, early 2000s, like, what is those like, weird movies, like Made to Order, or like, like those types of things that were on. Like it was like really a thing that plays at the beginning of that. It's like, Randomly, no one would ever listen to this band, but it's like a large part of my life. And I'm obsessed with them. Yeah, you found each other. Catherine Wheeler, she has a wonderful voice. I don't know if that fits. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. So it fits. It totally fits. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. all Thank the other stuff, so like the anime stuff, and that stuff, I wear it. So 
It doesn't work. I know. Uh, it's yeah. awesome. It, it, it's one of the cool things. It, you have everything on your, not sleeve, your your front, your chest. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You wear your heart on your chest. I do. So yeah. thank you so much, Anthony. Thank you for thank you. having this interview with yeah. us. It's been incredible. Again, pumped, super pumped. I hope everyone who's watching is also incredibly pumped. Uh, check out some of Second City's material. Anthony, is there anything that um, that you'd like to talk to the audience about that they can see? Check out the awesome kids that I work with. Like uh, Nickelodeon has the last book they put online. So there's a lot of things like all that uh, that I, one of the shows I work on, like it's awesome. Their kids are so funny. So check those out. And, and if you find those shows cool. The other thing that actually I do on a regular basis now, uh, I've done a couple of this, like two times, three times this year. Uh, I, I sometimes guest on this awesome podcast called Hello from the Magic Tavern. Uh, I'm on there as Jim, uh, Jamos Washington. Uh, I'm a, a, a wizard in that world, but it's a really awesome show. Uh, and the, the, the folks who put it together are really funny. They've been doing it for us uh, now six years now um, there are a lot of people on there that uh that you might know um that have guested on that show a lot of second city folks a lot of improv folks a lot of famous nerd folks um the last episode i did was their the six year anniversary it was the wizards council arnie camp and matt young uh and arnie uh um adel rafael or, or, or adel uh, are the main characters on that mm -hmm. uh, and then we had a bunch of people on there and one of the wizards is felicia day um, she's one of the wizards. So uh, it was fun. It was the first time I've always been before or after her in a lot of times and things because our oh. characters are related because she's in a love, love um, um, on again, off again relationship with the main wizard and the main wizard is like my mentor. So there's a whole kind of thing where like, I'll talk to him about her and it's really fun. Oh. But it was cool to then like do the show and finally like, get to play with her, which is really awesome. She's so funny and so amazingly talented. Um, and uh, so yeah, so check that out. It's a great, great podcast. Super fun. It's called Hello from the Magic Tavern. That's so cool. Okay, definitely going to check that out. Uh, so thank you again, everyone. Check out the podcast. Check out uh, all that. And just see how amazing Anthony is as a performer. You saw and heard all the incredible things that he's done. Thank you again for watching Talk About It Tuesday. My name is Angelica from This Is Improv. Please hit subscribe to see more videos just like this one. Like this video so we get some love. Comment below if you have any questions and we'll be happy to answer. Stick around next week for another amazing interview. Thank you again, Anthony. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>